Hi everyone and welcome to my talk at the Ray Summit 2020. Today I'm going to talk about our library at Hugging Face, uh, the Transformer Tokenizer and Dataset Library. Now we'll talk how you can use Ray to easily get state-of-the-art NLP model on your application. Let's start by a quick reminder on transfer learning. So what is transfer learning? So you have a link here to a full tutorial on transfer learning that we did last year at NACL. Be sure to check this out if you want more information. Here it will be just a very brief overview. So the traditional way we train a neural network model or like just a machine learning model is usually to gather a data set to initialize our weights or from scratch and then we train our model on your on your data set. And if, you have an, uh, in your, if you're faced with a new task, you usually gather a new data set, and you, again, you randomly initialize your weights from scratch, and you train your model on this second task. And the same if you're faced with a third task. Now, usually the way uh, human uh, learn is, is quite different. We, we kind of use like all the knowledge we've gathered on past tasks that we've tackled, and we use all this knowledge to um, learn a new task when we when we are faced with a new task, and this helps us do do two things in particular. It helps us learn with just a very uh, limited number of examples, and it also uh, helps us uh, reach better performances on this new task because we can fill in all the gaps between this uh, this uh, handful of uh, example. We can fill in all these gaps using the knowledge we've gathered on previous tasks. So transfer learning is one way to try to do that for machine learning systems. There are many ways to do transfer learning, but the way that we are mostly interested today is called sequential transfer learning. Sequential transfer learning means that you have a sequence of steps. Usually you have at least two steps. The first step is called pre-training, and the second step is called adaptation. Adaptation can actually include several sub-steps, but this is the simplest cases here. Um, Pre-training is a, a very computationally intensive step in which we try to gather as, mu as much data as we can. So we get what we, what we call a general purpose model. So you probably have heard about many of these models. Here you can see BERT, GPT, ULM FIT, ELMO, and maybe the, the first examples were the word to vec and the GLOVI uh, were the many. And the second step adaptation is, as I told you just, uh, just right now, is a data efficient step. So we can do uh, fine tuning. This is also called sometimes fine tuning. We can do fine tuning with just a very small uh, data set and reach good performances, okay? So this second step is uh, actually on your target data set. Here in the, during the pre-training, you, you gather as much training data as you can, so they are not, uh, not all the data is related to your target test, but during the adaptation, you have like a very small, uh, you have a small, small data set, and this one is really specific of the target task you're interested in. It can be test classification, token classification, question answering, and so on. The models that people use right now are mostly uh, called transformers. These models are quite efficient when you want to train them on large amount of data. So here is a, how the pre-training looks. You take a, a random, like you, you take an input, which is a sequence. For instance, here it's, my dog is a good dog. And then we mask one word, okay? This one is called, this pre-training objective is called mask language modeling. We mask one word, we input that in the model. The first uh, stage of the model is uh, input numbering. There's a set of input numbering which convert these words into uh, vectors. These vectors, they are not contextualized, okay? They don't really, they don't depend on the other vectors at this, at this first stage. But we would like each word to be a function of uh, the context, the left and the right context. So to do that, we have what we call an attention layer. And this, well, actually we have usually several attention layer, but this attention layer, they do weighted average between the words, okay? Each word, each, each vector here, will be transformed in the new vector, which is a weighted average of the surrounding words, and um, which also goes through a non-linearity. So you just, just don't have a, a linear model. And then at the end, you, you end up with uh, final hidden states that are depending on, that depends on the context. So here, this masked word, the final hidden states is actually a function of the, the left and the right context. 
And so we can then project this back on the vocabulary and we'll use a training objective, which is to predict the masked words. So here the model will be trained to reconstruct the word his from the mask token. Okay, this one is called lang mask language modeling, but you can do another variant, which is called language modeling. So this one is like the GPT CTR family of model. And in this one, you only attend to the left context. So you have a little bit less information than here, but um, you're trying to predict the next word, which means that for each word here, you have a training signal. For each input token, you have a training signal. So you have more training signal than in the case of birds, okay? This one is a bit more efficient in terms of, of training uh, uh, speed, uh, but you trade this with uh, less context. You can't really, one word can't be um, a function of the right context in this case. Now that we have pre-trained our model, we want to adapt it. So to adapt it, it's, pre it's pretty simple. We first start by removing the pre-training head. In our cases, it was just um, the, back prepare, the back projection on the vocabulary. And then we'll add a task specific uh, head on top instead of this pre-training head. It can be very simple, can be just a linear layer, can be very complex if you want to add a full LSTM on top of Bird, but you can do it. Uh, sometimes you also adapt to a task that is really different. For instance, you want to use your single model in an encoder-decoder setup to do, for instance, translation or summarization. And in the case, this, this adaptation task can be quite, quite complex. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have a, an input sentence. Jim Hansen was a puppeter. Okay, and we want to predict whether this input sequence is true or false. What are the various steps we are, we are doing? So the first step will be to um, what we call encode or tokenize this, this input sentence. So we want to split it in words. Some words are quite complex. Perpetrator is quite a weird word. And our models, they are made to be able to process the text for the whole, from the whole internet. They are made to be able to process like huge quantity of text. So how do we manage rare words? Well, the idea is that we will split them in subwords until we know all the subwords. So here, perpetrator will be split in puppet and er with the suffix er, and here we know both subparts of it. Okay, and we by by no, I mean they are they are in our model vocabulary. The vocabulary of a model is usually a few tens thousand of words. For instance, for birds, it's about fifty thousand of words. Okay. Now we can convert, now, 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 now that we have all these uh, subwords that are in our vocabulary, we can convert them in indices, which are just the indices in our, in our vocabulary. And this is a numeric input, so we can now use that as input for our model. The model is the, the transformer that we've just seen, okay? That output, as we've seen, it outputs vector, like hidden states, which are vectors for each input token, okay? So here we have a vector, like our vector have a dimension of four. Well, this is just an example in real life. The dimension is, is usually, the dimensionality is usually a, a few hundred, for instance, 768 for, for birds or something like that. Now that we have these hidden states, which are like contextualized vector associated to each token, we, can, we want to project them back to this dimensionality of two. So we just do a, a pooling here, for instance, just max pooling, or we can take like a special token at the beginning, which will be um, tasked to attend to all the sentence. Well, we reduce this matrix to one vector by one mean, and then we can just project this to a smaller dimension. For instance, we've just like a linear transform from the hidden state dimensionality down to our output class dimensionality. So the pre-trained model that you see here is trained during the pre-training phase. And the classifier that you see here is actually initialized from scratch during the adaptation or fine-tuning phase. And it's only trained on our small task target task data set, okay? But this is fine because this one is usually a very small, um, comprises a small number of parameters. It can be just like a, just a linear projection as I told you. Okay, so this is typically the, the typical workflow. Now, here is one example on a text classification task. This task is called Trek 6. The, the data set is called Trek 6. It's a six class text classification task. Um, and as you can see, when you, when you run the fine tuning, 
uh, you can see several things. The first thing that you can see is that just after one epoch on this, uh, on this uh, adaptation data set, it's a very small data set. It's like 2,500 examples. Okay, so it's, it's really small uh, in terms of deep learning size. So you can see that after one epoch of fine tuning, we're already down to less than 10% error rate. So we're already over 90% accuracy. This is really nice. And you can see that after three epochs, the error rate is down to 3.6, which is actually the, the state of the art. Well, it was the state of the art like, like last year. So this is quite nice, okay? And it's pretty robust. In this example, we took some uh, just uh, some hyperparameters that are given in the literature. We didn't do any hyperparameter search. And this is actually a big question because if you look at this, actually the situation is not always that great. <laughs> so there is actually a high variability. So I really like this paper by, by Jason, um, which is called Sentence Encoders on Stilt. And uh, in this paper, they try like various seeds and various hyperparameters. And you can see that you have like actually a high variance in the results. Here, these are all the tasks of uh, the GLU benchmark. The GLU benchmark is a the benchmark comprising several tasks. You have some tasks are like uh, COLA, which is linguistic acceptability task. This is a paraphrase classification task. This is sentiment. Uh, yeah, so you have many tasks and you can see that the variance is actually quite high. So sometimes, for instance, let's take MNLI for some seed, your model will just reach bad accuracy, like bad, bad performances. And for another seed, like another random seed to initialize the classifier layer at the top, um, you will get far better, far better performances, okay? So this is a little bit uh, of a problem because it means you can't really fine tune just with one go and it actually leads to what happens um, usually in, um, in the literature, which is that we do a hyperparameter search for fine tuning. And here is one example for Roberta. Um, as you can see, for the, for the WSC, which is the Winograd uh, Schema Challenge, for the Winograd Schema Challenge, um, they did like a scan over three learning rates, three batch size. Um, for like total number of updates and also the seeds. So in the end, they get like a hundred runs of for the hyperparameter search. So they just choose the seven best model and assemble them. So this is actually uh, not trivial to do. And this is why today I will show you how to do that with Ray, this kind of hyperparameter search, okay? So let's talk a little bit about our library before we, we have a quick hands-on showing you how to use them. A hugging face. So what is Hugging Face doing? Hugging Face started with a conversational AI project. Um, and while we were developing this conversational AI uh, product, we started to open source some tools we've built for transfer learning. And actually these tools, they get really a lot of interest in the community. So we now have uh, decided to focus on this and to make our goal to accelerate and catalyze and democratize the research level work that's happening in NLP. It's in a uh, language understanding, but it's also in natural language generation. And we do that by open sourcing library mostly. Our first library that you probably know is called the transformer library. You probably know it if you're working in NLP. It's designed to be like super easy and super fast way to access state of the art NLP model as they are like published and uh, open source by researcher. The idea is that uh, you should be able to like reuse a bird without having to train it from scratch because the training is super, super um, computationally intensive. Uh, it's available for both TensorFlow and PyTorch. So um, it's uh, right now we have like 24 models, but it's growing quite quickly. So we started with BERT and the GPT series, and now there are also a bunch of uh, encoder decoder models like BART. Uh, like efficient model like Electra, uh, dialogue model like sparse attention model like reformer or long former. And we also have non-parametric models like DPR. So it's really uh, quite active. You can use it very simply, as I told you. You just uh, like uh, have a bunch of, you, you have a bunch of class like model, tokenizer, uh, and configuration class. And with this, you can do pretty much everything. 
you have this form pre-trained method that will load the pre-trained weights and, uh, and the vocabulary from, from, um, from our model hub, and then you can run the model very, very easily. You can check it out here. Here is our model hub. There is like over 2,000 models accessible in like many, many languages. You have uh, like a hosted inference API where you can try the model online. And if you up upload a new model, you can also add your own model. A lot of these are, are community uh, provided, uh, shared by the community. And you can play with the models online to try to test them a little bit as well. We also have now a new tokenization library, which is there to make it um, very fast to, to run the models. Um, so yeah, it can encode one gigabyte in 20 seconds. It's called tokenizers and you can uh, install it. It's available for Python, Node.js, and it's based, it's uh, actually the, the core language is in Rust, which is super fast. And recently, a few months ago, we open sourced a new library called Dataset. That was early, the only name was NLP, but now it's actually more general than that. So it's called Dataset. And the idea of this library is to provide uh, easy access to data, to data, um, data sets and also data processing and to NLP metrics. Okay. So it, it kind of cover the full uh, pipeline of uh, NLP processing right now. Um, it's a very lightweight library, uh, giving you access to many public data sets in just one line. And you can add your new data set and your new metrics as well. Uh, it's made for like a wide variety of, of framework. It's, it's built for, for NumPy, Pandas, Pandas, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Uh, it's very, very efficient on huge data sets. You can load Wikipedia, the full Wikipedia, with just nine megabytes of, of RAM. And you can also iterate like super fast. There is a lot of very fast stuff like smart caching and it's, it's just very efficient. And it's quite easy. Here is how you can encode and process a uh, glue data set for, for training. This is the full pre-processing uh, script, okay? So you just load the data set here. This one, you will just load the data set in, in something that is like a Python container, like a, like a list basically, it looks like that. Then you can map some, um, some processing uh, function on this. So in our case, we map the tokenizer to, talk, to encode the, the input. Then we select which columns we will want to output and to, to use in our PyTorch model. And we can just load that directly in a, in a PyTorch data loader and it, it works, okay? You can check this out at uh, Hugging Face datasets. And we also have a dataset hub where you can access all the datasets and you can actually explore them on the, on, online. So check how they look, okay? Okay, great. Now um, for the last uh, minutes, let me show you um, hands-on exercise. So here you have the links to the collab and also a nice uh, medium blog post by, um, by the Ray team showing how to do a little bit more than what I show you today. Okay, um, there we go, collab. Okay, this show you a bit how you can use this tool. So this is just uh, installing an LP. Uh, here we have some information on GPU, nothing very interesting here. And we install, um, well, this, this is now called data sets, but at the time I was recording this library, it was still called, this, this video, it was still called NLP, but just just, uh, just put in your mind a data set instead of NLP. Uh, we install transformer, we want to train a model, and we will want to do a hyperparameter search, okay? So um, we will do, um, okay. So we will do, uh, we will do use ray tune. Okay, let's go, let's go very quickly. So uh, we import NLP transformer, we import tune, and then we just load our tokenizer and our data set and also the metric. So the nice thing about the metric here is that they're associated to benchmark. So you sure that you have the metric that is actually relevant for the, for the, the sub -part. For instance, glue has several subsets here we, we look at the MRPC subset of glue, the glue benchmark, and each subset have a different metric. So here using load metric, you're sure you will have the relevant metric for the subset you're interested in. 
So here we download the data set, the metric, the tokenizer. As I told you, the data set is just a, just a container. So you, you, you have like several splits. If you print the data set object, you see we have three splits in our, in our data set, train, test, validation. And each split, you can access the, um, the first element, for instance, when you do that set train zero. And the first element is just a, dict, a dictionary, a Python dictionary with, like, the, um, with the feature of the data set. So here we have an index, the label, and the two sentences. And the feature are actually typed. So if you print data set uh, feature, you can have the type and you see that the IDX is just an uh, integer. The label is actually a label with two classes, which are uh, called not equivalent and equivalent. MRPC is a, is a paraphrase classification task. Um, so the paraphrase uh, means that the two sentences are either equivalent or not equivalent. And then the two sentences are just string, okay? To tokenize the data set, as we've seen earlier, you can define a, a function. Here, this will be the encode function that will actually apply our tokenizer on the first and the second sentence. And it will just return this, and we just map this function on the data set, okay? Batch at egal true means that we, we will actually send batches of string to the tokenizer. And here we can use the fact that some tokenizer are very efficient on batches. This is just batch for, for map functions. This is not the batch of, of a Python string. Trains. Now we need to rename a little bit because the colon label um, in the transformer models they use a colon call they, they use an input called labels so we rename this colon label in labels and we are ready we can give a look at our data set the feature have changed because we've added the uh, we've added the encoded feature so now we have the input IDs which is a sequence of uh, of integers. We also have an attention mask, which is also an in integers and token type IDs. These are like things that birds want. And the label are now called labels, okay? And if we look at the first element of the training set, you can see our, our IDs here. This will be the inputs to our model, okay? So we're ready now to, to train. One thing is that we don't really want to give our, our deep learning model these strings, okay? We, we just want to give them the integers. So we'll actually filter the columns here. This set format will means that if we query like an, it, an, an item in the data set, we just get this, these columns here outputted, okay? So here you can see that once we've set the format to only output the integral columns, we only get the integral columns here, okay? And now we can train our model. The training loop is very simple. We put the model in training mode, set them on the device, but they go, made the, out, the batch go in the model, then the output. Then we do a little bit of gradient accumulation step. This helps us using large batch on the single GPU of Colab. And we do an evaluation using our metrics. So for each batch, we'll add the batch of, we extract the prediction. We took the argmax, which is the most likely uh, class uh, predicted by a model. And at the end, when we finish evaluation, we just compute the metric. And we can add a little uh, training function that will do a hyperparameter search. We search over the learning rate, the number of epoch, the bias, the seed, the batch size, the schedule, so a lot of things. If the batch is too big, we use gradient accumulation. And using our seed, we can build the model, the train data loader, the optimizer, and for the number of epochs we've decided to train our model, we train our model. And we can do pruning based on intermediate values. So if at the end of the first epoch, like our evaluation matrix are too bad, we just stop it. And then we run with BERT. As you can see, it's pretty easy. We use one scheduler and we use the tune.run. Okay. The, uh, here are our metrics, uh, like the metrics we are tracking with, with tune. And when we rerun it, you get like a lot of uh, testers. And you found the best config, which is with this kind of learning rate, three epoch like this seed and, and batch size, like this. And um, here is the output. Let's see, yeah, we can run it again to get the evaluation. And here is the accuracy we get at the end, which is uh, 0.86 accuracy and an F1 of 0 0.90. So you can check on the glue MRPC. This is actually a very good result. And this is kind of like the state of the art, okay? So as you can see, this was like really simple to do. Um, and I hope you enjoy this talk.